Okay, it is now 12 in Toronto, and I want to welcome you all here for this uh, virtual lunch together with, with Hannah Zeven. And uh, I'll tell you about Hannah very shortly. I should say that these virtual lunches are always a lot of fun and always interesting, and you'll be invited to ask questions. If you feel comfortable having your screen on so we can see a lot of faces, it's always a friendly thing to do. But for various reasons, you might not want to do it, which is perfectly okay, too. So um, I want to, again, thank you for joining us. This summer is our summer of free virtual lunches and a few other things. So I'll just start off uh, before I get into today's program with a few things that are coming up because we're scheduling these things so quickly that you know, we really haven't spread the word too much. But in terms of our virtual lunches, next week on the 19th, we're going to have Sharon Ramsey, who is a past president of the Ontario Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, a longtime leading therapist in, in Ontario, who's involved with a group called Just Relating, which really looks at racial issues in therapy. Uh, she'll bring some of her colleagues, uh, all with a background in emotionally focused therapy. So she'll be with us for virtual lunch next week. Uh, the following week on July 26, we'll have Martin Anthony, who's really one of the most prolific writers on behavioral therapy. He's written over 30 books, presented for us for a long, long time. And he'll be with us to talk about kind of behavior therapy, where it's at, how it's changed, CBT, all that kind of stuff. And then in August, we are going to have Bruce Ecker, who's a developer of coherence therapy, which is really a way to look at how people change, not by using one particular approach in therapy, but what are the commonalities that make a difference in therapy in terms of lots of things. So that's coming up in August. And of course, you're invited to attend all of these just by registering and signing up. Um, also happy to tell you that the other thing, our agenda, which we're kind of getting the word out, is a big uh, four weeks of training in Cancun, of all places, next February uh, at an all-inclusive resort uh, with speakers like Janina Fisher, Bessel van der Kolk, Ron Siegel, Terry Real, lots of people. I know it's a little bit early right now in the summer to be thinking about what you're going to be doing next February, but we're just trying to whet your appetite and uh, let you think about this, what will be, I think, a very exciting uh, a learning opportunity in a beautiful place next February. So those are some of the things we're working on, in, as well as a whole webinar uh, schedule for September through January with a lot of people you will know and recognize. Uh, so we're working on those things as well. Okay. That's kind of the commercial. So here's, uh, here's how we're gonna do this today. For one thing, you may see Hannah on the screen and you may see Emily Porter, Leading Edge on your screen. Emily is always our hostess with the mostess, which means she's there for you and for Hannah. Uh, if you have questions, um, when we come to the question period, either you can just make a note in the chat box that you'd like to ask a question, if you'd like to come on screen, or um, you can just say um, what the question is and Emily would be happy to read it for you. Um, also, the chat box can be used for any, any kind of communication you want to have with Emily if you have any technical problems or anything else. The chat box will also be used for uh, any resources that come up, including Hannah's new, Hannah's new book, which we have a link from Cavershop Booksellers. It's not ready, it's not on sale yet, but we'll be talking more about that. And with everything that we do, we record all our sessions. So you're going to get uh, a link to this uh, sent to you probably in the next 24 hours if there's something you want to have a look at again. Um, we, all our webinars and free stuff, everything we send you that link. That's one of the nice things about Zoom. So let me introduce Hannah, uh, Hannah to you. First, um, you know, Hannah's new book, The Distance Cure, is coming out on August 17th. So she's not a name that's well known if, in the therapy world. But I think this book is going to bring her front and center for a lot of people because she's worked on it for seven years. Uh, planned on publishing it before the word pandemic was part of our general vocabulary. Um, and now here, here this book is coming out. Hannah received her BA from Yale in 2012, and then her PhD uh, from the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at NYU, 
in 2018. And currently she's in California as a lecturer in the Department of English and History at the University of California in Berkeley. She also teaches um, at the Berkeley Center for Science, Technology, Medicine and Society. And she's a visiting fellow at Columbia University's Center for the Study of Social Dif Difference. And also serves as the editorial associate for the Journal of um, the American Psychoanalytic Association. And she's published extensively besides her upcoming book uh, in magazines such as the Journal of Feminist Cultural Studies, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Life, uh, Real Life Magazine, Slate Logic Magazine, and, and many others. So her first book is called The Distance Cure, A History of, Tel of Teletherapy. And as I said, it's coming out next month. So, um, Hannah, before we get into the book, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to people? Tell us a little about your background, what got you interested in this topic uh, and other on um, many of the other topics you've been writing and you've been interested in. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Michael and Emily, and for all of you for joining. Um, well, you just introduced me so fully, um, but how, and thank you for that. Um, how did I come to teletherapy? Well, as Michael said, um, I became invested in thinking about teletherapy as psychotherapy and other forms of, of psychological care shadow form long before the pandemic. Um, it was a useful aperture for retelling the history of psychology along the 20th century and into the present. Um, and so the book starts with Freud himself, arguing that as long as we've had psychotherapy, we've also had teletherapy. Uh, and Freud was a consummate practitioner of it, uh, as well as a distanced patient. Uh, and then the book moves across the 20th century from, you know, uh, radio broadcasts in World War II, where during the Blitz, there was no ability to meet in the room in person. So the radio came in as a form of teletherapy to suicide hotlines, um, which were doing all kinds of work to depathologize vulnerable groups. Um, the first US suicide hotline was run by a queer priest, um, but who was deeply invested in uh, psychodynamic therapy and listening uh, through to early e-clinics and the elusive uh, work to build a robot therapist, an AI therapist. Um, and I became interested in it precisely uh, because it brought together two loves. Uh, one was the history of psychology and the other is the history of technology. So yes, these are, I have nerdy loves. Um, and uh, there was just this gap where some people had written a little bit about say VR, uh, really great work on VR for veterans. Um, or some people had written a little bit about say Winnicott's radio broadcasts um, in World War II. But this you know, kind of claim uh, that teletherapy has been around for over a hundred years and what it might have done to reconfigure the history of psychotherapy this way was there for the taking. Um, and so I did for seven years. And then as Michael said, um, this sort of strange thing happened, which is that the book had been under review for quite some time. And then suddenly we were all sent home. Um, so maybe March 13th, 2020 for me. I don't know when your lockdown in Ontario started the same, uh, roughly. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly this, this shift happened, which was that teletherapy stopped being the shadow form. And overnight and quite traumatically for many practitioners and for patients, it was the only thing on offer. Um, and it was just after that, that the book was accepted for publication, having gone through its peer review process, which allowed, and this is the last thing I'll say, which allowed me to then write a quota about the pandemic as it was starting to unfold, but only starting. So the book ends last June. And we've been, maybe that was optimistic because of course we are still predominantly, um, at least in the United States context, you know, talking on phone and on Zoom, not just in therapy, but as we're doing right now. Well, well thank you for that summary. Um, and we're going to get into some of the learnings you've had that will be relevant to therapists. You know, when we started off doing these kind of virtual lunches in March of last year, 
you know, the first reaction is, what am I going to do? Should I just close my office and wait? Maybe by June, I'll be able to open up again. We'll get through a few months and life will resume. Uh, I, I could never do teletherapy. And then, of course, uh, people have learned a lot. And there's been a lot of changes in, 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 in the opinion of whether or not you're going to stay with clients uh, on Zoom for a long, long time or go back to the office. But I want to go back to Freud for a second, because... Um, I think a lot of people would be surprised to, to say that you say that he was like the first person to really be interested in, in, in a different kind of therapy, not just in a room. And you argue that he believed in teleanalysis. So tell us about how you think Freud made the, the switch from seeing people in office like doctors did back then to something different. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. We're always trying to go back to Freud, right? It's always uh, fun to start with uh, the original. Um, so in Freud's moment, you know, in the late 1800s, uh, Freud is deeply involved and not alone. Uh, later today, I was telling Michael, I will go from this immediately to teaching on Zoom, right? So just walk around. And I'm teaching Freud's autobiography later today to my students in lecture. And of course, Freud in that autobiography says it was all him. And we know better. Um, there were many people involved in elaborating um, what becomes psychoanalysis. In Freud's moment, one of the major anxieties uh, for psychoanalysis is how to have it be taken seriously as a science. Uh, this is something that, as we probably all know a little bit, has dogged psychoanalysis and still does. Uh, is it a science? Is it not? Uh, that can be a big range. In Freud's moment, it was charlatanism or it was science. There was one or the other. Um, and so I, I've written about this a little bit elsewhere, too, and I can drop a, a link to a short article about this. Right, Freud, in his moment, is doing a lot of what we in media studies would call remediating um, or transposing the doctor's consulting room to what's going to become the therapist's room that we still all use. I mean, so much of this starts then. Um, and there's a beautiful book by my colleague, Nate Kravis, also an MIT press called On the Couch, which is a history of, of the consulting room uh, and the couch in it. So Freud um, had many things open to him. One was, of course, the office. The other was that postal cures had been uh, in use for centuries, right, um, and becoming ever more prevalent. Because if you're in Vienna as the doctor, but everyone else is outside of Vienna, there's going to be a lot of work in the post. Um, Freud, unfortunately, and oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. That's amazing. Um, that's Nate's book, and it's really quite beautiful. Um, so Freud had these postal cures in the background. He had taken them like for the body. Um, and then he had the misfortune of becoming best, best, best friends, like the way fifth graders become like attached at the hip, right? Best friends with a man who did not live in Vienna, but lived in Berlin. And this man was Wilhelm Fleece, who's a very minor character from the history of psychology, um, except for the fact that he was Freud's best friend for a time before they had a horrific friend breakup and falling out. Um, and it was with this man that Freud developed psychoanalysis in what is called the origin of psychoanalysis, the letters that Freud wrote to him and back and forth. And this is called Freud's self-analysis in the literature all done by letter writing. The men maybe hung out in person five times in their lives, but they had this extreme correspondence almost daily where Freud invents the Oedipus complex. He begins to invent the interpretation of dreams, uh, the psychopathology of everyday life and so on over eight years. So that is Freud's analysis. That fact is not disputed. I'm just, uh, and not just because I think it is a bit controversial. I'm saying it's not Freud who's doing the analysis on his own. It's an analysis happening over letter writing. Less controversially, Freud just straight up treated people via the post. Um, so little Hans, Freud's only child patient. That was all a postal cure. The entire analysis uh, transpires by letter. So that's where I start. Um, Freud was obsessed with new media. Um, and you know there are so many metaphors for mediation in psychoanalysis. Uh, the analytic encounter is like a telephone call, um, right? The memory is like a mystic writing pad. 
But what this chapter tries to do is say, actually, though, Freud was really using media too uh, for treatment. He was doing analysis over a distance. Okay, can you take us through, you know, when you were writing this book, you were, you were, you were looking at from Freud moving forward, not knowing there'd be a pandemic that would give you a lot to think about and write about and everybody else. So what were the other uh, high points along the way in terms of a different kind of therapy, not in a room with a person that you looked into and, and what you found? Thank you. Um, well, that chapter, the Freud chapter, was probably the most stimulating to write. It was also the first chapter um, because, you know, it's a really, really rich archive and it has wild stories. Like there's a princess who's helping people escape Nazis. I mean, it's great, great stuff for the historian. Um, but there were, there were more solemn chapters um, that were less sort of... Um, fun, but deeply moving and instructive. And, you know, so what comes to mind is, of course, the history of the suicide hotline, which I mentioned briefly, which I think we've, um, I don't know, I think we've, we've just not remembered or misremembered or bracketed it as a form of teletherapy, um, precisely uh, because it's so minoritized, it's free. This was another finding in the book that I just want to flag in case it won't come up again that one thing that drove the writing of the book for seven years was finding out that indeed almost every example in the book had transpired for free or was very, very low fee. So there was this whole history of teletherapy doing what we now say it will do, which the way we're going now it won't do. So it's kind of paradoxical, um, which is bringing in new kinds of patients and offering a kind of flexible help that previously wasn't on offer. So in the case of the suicide hotline, I don't know. I thought I'd find out that it started in the 1980s or 1990s, but no, the 1950s um, and started by really radical moving um, folks who are coming out of the pastoral care tradition. Um, they were almost all clergy men and their secretaries who, as we know, are um, perfect at uh, non-judgmental listening and taking in a lot of detail only to say the right thing back, right? And so they use this kind of secretarial labor combined with pastoral labor, uh, studying with great psychiatrists at the time, but also I don't know how big he is in Canada, Hope, hopefully not, but Norman Vincent Peale, this total Americana figure um, uh, who, you know, the right way and uh, what is his famous book called? The Power of Positive Thinking, right? So these folks were all helping to make hotlines. Um, and so that was a form that runs right through the present. Of course, now is algorithmic. Now uh, geolocates you, uh, many of the hotlines, almost all of them. Uh, now is imbricated with policing, which in the United States context, you know, is, is very controversial and important to think about, is all anti-suicide, where in the 1950s, the understanding was much more indebted to Durkheim. Um, and uh, so that case uh, helped me think about how we're still doing these kinds of algorithmic therapies, um, but starting all the way in the 1950s. Um, or right, another chapter that's very, was all of its work was prescient to our moment on uh, the question of, can we script out the therapist altogether, right? This kind of endless panic of, will our labor be obviated? Um, and that also starts way earlier than I thought in the 1950s and 1960s, the same moment. Um, and I guess one of the surprises there is why the same moment in the 1960s, um, which has to do with that's when a new set of anxieties uh, about clinical labor really take hold, that we don't have enough clinicians, that the population needs much more help than it's receiving, and that there's no way to connect these two disparate groups. Um, and so whether it's hotlines or AI uh, or eventually email, every sort of gesture in teletherapy is about trying to fix that bad math between people who want help but can't receive it and people who might want to give it but can't reach the right patient. Now, in your book, you also say um, that technologic, tech, technology and mental health produces 
a medium specific forms of distanced intimacy, which is a very interesting word, words, distance intimacy, which rather than simply undermining embodied togetherness and attachment also allows for unexpected kinds of communication. So what, what kind of unexpected kinds of communication have you seen and, and, and do they work? Do they help people? Um, you know, there are a lot of apps now that people are using for all kinds of reasons. So what's your general view of, of these kinds of things? Great, thank you. Well, this is really a two-part question um, because the apps are, as I was saying, they often say, and in fact, their marketing taglines are things like therapy for all and not so much. And we can talk about that, of course. Um, the distanced intimacy idea is was born because even seven years ago when I started writing this, in general, when I talk to clinicians, and there's a lot of oral history with clinicians working now, but also across this whole time period who are still living, or and now actually, unfortunately, many of whom have passed away in the last seven years, um, who just assumed in general that if you say teletherapy, the response would be much lesser and crappier version of care. Uh, last resort, terrible stuff. Um, I think that that's changed a lot in the pandemic and that we can talk about that change. I've been really startled to see that change, not for everyone, uh, not with every patient, but in general, uh, you know, there's anxiety about going back, all kinds of anxiety. Um, so distanced intimacy was a way of talking about this surprise where the thing did work and it worked in very particular contexts um, whether it's Freud with his best friend and looking at all of the postal conventions in 1890 that allow for us to feel like we're together, where we just forget that we're apart, um, or where the apartness is precisely what's productive. So there's a patient in the book, in the last chapter of the book, whose name is Mary Ainsworth. Why can I say her name? She wrote, and you know, self case studies in our fields are very rare. She wrote one, and she might be the only telepatient to ever have written exclusively about a teletherapy. So I found this, and uh, Ainsworth talks about, and I don't think any relation to the attachment uh, therapist Ainsworth, which I, I mean, if I could figure that out, but I haven't been able to. Um, maybe her daughter. Um, that would be funny precisely because Ainsworth, the patient, could not tolerate being in the room. And so she wouldn't. And we, if we say, okay, no, no teletherapy, either show up or nothing, then this woman who is in quite a bit of extremis would have never um, received any treatment, any help. And instead, and this is the early 1990s, she finds a guy online who has a cyber clinic. Um, and Lucky for her, the guy is a phenomenal clinician, a lovely man to talk to, David Summers, who works at the National Institute of Mental Health now in the US. So high repute guy. Of course, this could have gone, and, and Summers and I talked about this, uh, a terrible way, right? There could have been a terrible scam on the net. And in fact, there were people posing as teletherapists uh, in the early 1990s. But Ainsworth only was able to work on a kind of email basis uh, with the therapy. She couldn't even do uh, synchronous chatting like we're doing right now in the chat. Um, and so trying to think about why this might be and why it might work for her. And eventually, in fact, she, Summers and she worked on it and he, she came into treatment and she couldn't talk after years. And then they went back to email and everything was kind of fine. The work continued. So thinking about why that might be, what is it specifically about email, not chat, not the phone, not in person, that is the right medium at the right kind of dosage at the right level that allows interpretation to happen. And the theory uh, I call it, so the distance intimacy on the one hand and why, the why of it, that's the name for identifying what's happening. The why of it I talk about as the medium inside which is why some people can handle, say, when the screen glitches and, and it's kind of okay. And other patients, when they say, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now on teletherapy? They're not really talking about, can you hear me now? They're talking about something much more deep inside uh, about being dropped or lost. Um, and so trying to think about how that works, which is a very individualist question, as well as a societal one, as well as one about media. And the work is trying to always think about those three levels together. 
because as we all know, right, it's very hard to make recommendations. Each patient and each dyad is working very specifically together. Um, but there are some things that we can look at uh, sociologically and generally as well. Yeah, I'd like to follow it up with that question about what therapists can learn um, from the research you've done about the efficacy of, of working with people online. Uh, are there certain kinds of pe patients, certain kinds of gen whether gender or age, or a kind of therapy? Uh, there's many different types of therapy that either work better or don't work very well when working with people online. Great, thank you. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that Zoom is only one of the media we can use. So some folks, including clinicians, right? There's a reason why Freud was into the couch. It is exhausting to stare into, and obviously we know this, right? Um, Michael and my faces are much closer right now than they ever would be if we were speaking in person. I have about, I'd say 10 inches between my eyes and the little green light on my computer. Michael, I don't know about you, right? It's very um, high intensity actually. And this was something I was surprised by that many of the clinicians I interviewed found 2020 and 2021 teletherapy much more intimate and much more intensive than they would have thought when then they would have guessed. And that was the problem, not a lack of intimacy, uh, especially, I don't know how many of you use noise canceling headphones right, where the patient's face is much closer and their voice is much closer. Um, one person I interviewed called it uh, telepathy, right, that the feeling is almost telepathic, uh, how intense. Um, so, uh, okay, so backing up, we don't have to do that, right? We could, we could decide it would be a lot less engaging to have a conversation like this. I could call right back in and do it on the phone, right? And that each of these will regulate different kinds of intimacy. That's one thing. Um, and there's a lot more to say about each of those modes. The telephone almost always forces us to be dialogic. The therapist is gonna start speaking a lot more than they would otherwise. Um, it's unconscious, it's how we interpret the phone. Uh, it takes a lot of work to manage. Uh, the Zoom room is supposed to remediate any kind of face-to-face. -face. So these are, these are some things to think about. Um, what kinds of patients really, really have a hard time with the digital? In general, kids, children, who are used to playing and being in the room. Um, and this is for, um, Oh, many reasons. One is that uh, I just saw a beautiful talk. I can drop the link. Um, I was on a panel about going back to the office not that long ago. Um, and one of the people was a child therapist who was talking about how every single one of her patients, whenever Zoom glitches, they have to go get a parent to restart the computer, which means the parent is always on hand, which means that there's a kind of feeling of being surveyed. And for so many kids who are in play therapy, that's just about the worst thing that could happen. What's not a problem is playing together online. It's a different flavor, but there's a lot of really brilliant, you know, making do that's coming out of people who work with kids. But I think little kids who can't manage the digital stuff on their own, I feel like I was very persuaded that that should be almost a wholesale recommendation. Um, even if kids can say more online because they are dislocated from the therapist. Adolescents, conversely, say much more when you're not in the room together, apparently. Um, again, I'm not a clinician. We should just say that I'm a researcher who've spoken and interviewed qualitatively many, many clinicians from all kinds of backgrounds and from around the world, not just in the US. Um, but these two things come up again and again. Kids, not so much. Adolescents, bingo. Um, Adolescents feel more secure paradoxically at distance right now. Um, and that was also true for the last 40 years. Um, then I think there are other people, right? People who have, um, who are working on specific things who might want to come in, uh, whether that's attachment, boundaries, et cetera, or who might paradoxically not need to. But in general, um, adults tend to do okay 
even if there's a deep preference and we should we should think about preference as well it's not just what works but also what feels better and then analyze that or think about why it feels better and if we should kowtow to feeling better or doing something that might feel less fun but might actually give us what we need which i think often um you know uh, we're now thinking a lot about expedience about therapeutic labor about cost all of which matter and need to be thought alongside also the work that you all are doing um, and where it happens best, most deeply, effectively, et cetera. Great. Uh, we do have a lot of clinicians on the screen and, and watching today, and we're gonna open up for questions in just a minute, but I wanna have a little diversion because you're, you're working in another book that I, I wondered if there are any insights you have that might be interesting to therapists and the book is called mother's little helpers technology in the american family i know that's coming out next year um, but in the research you've done are you finding things that might give therapists some insights on the american family today um, that just might help them in their work with couples with families uh, with individuals or kids Thank you so much. So the book, the book is coming out ostensibly two years from oh, two years. Right now. <laughs> you get for a second. Oh, two years. Like, That's um, I'm going to go have a panic attack off screen, but two oh, years. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> I have to write the thing. Um, although a lot of it is now sketched in and some of it is starting to come out a little bit. Um, that book is looking and it is, you know, Canada and the U S we have some similarities, but we also have many, many differences. Uh, and my grandfather was Canadian, so he, he made the big mistake of coming across the border. Um, one difference that we have is we have no social net. Um, so uh, women, historically, are the US social net. Uh, when COVID started, right, the assumption is like women are gonna quit their jobs and stay home with their kids. And in fact, 4.5 million US women did do that. Um, I haven't had, as just one anecdotal example, an hour of childcare since March 13th, 2020. I have a two-year-old. Um, so that's why that book can't come out next year. Uh, <laughs> that would be really bad. Um, so the book thinks about all of this sort of social, political, economic phenomena in the context of how technology has come in as an adjunctive form of care um, and as co-mommy for over a hundred years. I like this big sweep. That's how I make my projects. Um, and also looking deeply at the way women, specifically mothers, have been pathologized in their use of technology with their children. So I think there's some historical lessons um, as well as going all the way up into the contemporary for how we whether we mean to or not pathologize women who are trying to do the best they can by and large um, and also making use of technology, whether that's the first chapter is called Hot and Cold Mothers, which looks at the history of that pathologization from the refrigerator mother and the autistic child through to the helicopter mother and the child who's diagnosed with ADHD and ADD in the US. That might be interesting. I don't know how clinically helpful yet, um, but also to look at this very intensive role that technology plays, uh, whether it's as a watcher or as a helper or as a distractor. Um, and so when you said couples, I actually thought actually that might be a place where it could be interesting and helpful to clinicians, as well as those working with children, a deeper understanding, psychological understanding of this, you know, deep imprecation that technology has with our lives, the emotional life of being what we all are now, which is users um, and from a very, very young age and thinking about the double valence of that worse word user, right? Where it, it sort of betrays an addictive notion. It sort of betrays a kind of tool notion for use, et cetera. But I'll know more in two years when I've written more, <laughs> but thank you for that question. <laughs> well, thank uh, you. Tell my editor, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> okay, what I'd like to do now is just open it up for questions. And there's a number of ways you can ask questions. Uh, on your Zoom, the bottom of your screen, you have a hand raising function. We also do the old fashioned hand raising function which goes like this, that's allowed. Emily will be um, hosting this part of, of this hour. 
Uh, so either raise your hand virtually, raise it, or just put something in the chat line, either a comment or a question that Emily can read, or just say you'd like to come on screen that way. So I'm wondering who would like uh, to start off with any kind of comment about what you've learned about teletherapy this year and how it might be relevant to Hannah's work or any question you have for her. Yeah, um, Rapinder had a question. Hi, Rapinder. Hi, hi everyone. Um, hi, Hannah. I'm really enjoying um, this conversation. And um, I'm an art therapist. And so you can just imagine that when COVID hit, we were like, oh, like I had done, you know, I had done teletherapy, I'd done um, phone therapy with adults and parents. Um, but with children, I was like, well, how do you how do you do art therapy online? Um, and I think that we've done some really interesting work. Um, but I was just really curious, Hannah, if you had interviewed any art therapists and if you had, um, if you had any insights or learnings from that. I'd, just really curious. Thank you so much. And thank you for sure. I can only imagine the just wait, how are we supposed to do this? Hold it up in front of the screen. Um, you know, talking about those, the, the child therapists I've interviewed who work a number of them, primarily their primary tool is via like either exactly or adjacent to Winnicott's squiggle game, which is just drawing as open-ended free association for folks who, um, and the, these therapists also had that moment of just like, what are we going to do? And also this real worry of the discontinuity of care, right? If you take yeah. even five minutes to figure out what's gonna happen, but you have a session in one minute, the every, right? Like, is that a dropping? Is that, anyway. Um, and they talked about remediating the whiteboard, right? On Zoom, where we have this really basic feature um, and the other thing that they talked about was the move to more digital art and media uh, and just jumping wholesale. Um, but I think only a few of them. In general, the book had to delimit. This was actually a question that faced me seven years ago was, was I going to deal with art therapy as mediated therapy um, and deal with things like VR? And I decided it would be too much and that someone else, maybe you, uh, should write that book specifically from that point of view. Um, but yeah, I can only imagine. Can you say a little bit about how you negotiated it? I'm so curious. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been fantastic, actually. Like, I was so surprised by... Um, just the way our child clients have engaged in the space. And so, um, you know, for example, like um, the, yeah, the whiteboard, I would have a whiteboard. Um, sometimes I was creating, they didn't want to make art. It gave them a lot of, um, I think what really struck me was that it gave the child client um, more ownership and more empowerment. So they were able to share things in their space. They were able to bring their toys. They were able to bring um, things that were important to them. That was really kind of uh, kind of neat. Um, and then some clients, um, they also use the Zoom in a really interesting way. So they would put me on mute. Um, they would go off camera and they would hide under, they would hide in the room and then I'd have to try and find or guess where they were. So it became really, really playful as well. Um, the other piece that we did was that, um, myself and my team we would we would make art if they didn't want to make art we would make art and then we would mail it to them we would post uh, it to, them to continue the relationship especially because it sort of felt so disjointed that we weren't seeing them in person so um it's actually maybe i do write that book because it's been it's been really fascinating yeah and please do um and stay i'm gonna put my email in the chat for everyone but i would love to stay in touch um you know, one thing that kept coming up in the book again and again that I wasn't expecting, including through to now, is that moment where, okay, we're already distanced and mediated. What if we use multiple media? So not just Zoom, but also recruiting mail and posting is amazing. Uh, and there be moments like the advice column. We know, right? Used to rely on the letter, now relies on email. But like fantastic psychoanalysts used to have advice columns. And then if you look in their archives, they're doing back channel email referral, like all kinds of work, just layering the mediation on top of each other, also hopping on the phone. So I think that's so ingenious. I'm so glad to have heard of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
We, we also had a comment from someone who said um, that for most children, having parents drop off the child at a session, set up the link and say hi to the therapist, and then pick up the child at the end, come back in at the right time, say goodbye, shut off the computer, regular uh, regularizes the parental contact. It ensures that the parent is somewhere nearby, like in a waiting room, and it seems to work. Um, also ensuring that the parent has a phone with them that they can be reached at is very important, and having to contact the parent to help with computer glitches is not unlike calling the parent because the child has to go to the washroom or for some other reason that sometimes occurs during an in-person session. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I see Kate has her hand up. Kate, do you want to unmute and let us know where you're from? Hi there. Let me just... Hi, Kate. Um, I am uh, on this call from Waterloo, Ontario. Um, I am doing a six month externship at an agency called Horizon. I started, I started doing my MA before the pandemic um, and finished it during the pandemic, graduated last month. Congratulations. Uh, so I did, thank you. So I did my entire internship online. So I've graduated and I'm registered with our, our provincial college as a psychotherapist, but I've never physically sat with a client, which is really weird. And people talk about how is it going to be when we go back to the office and, and like, oh, this will be better than that. And I don't even know, will it be better? And none of our profs taught us about teletherapy because it, they didn't know it was about to become an incredibly important thing. And even at the agency, there wasn't a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of experience on the team because it had been a not completely in-person team they were we were I was learning with all the seasoned clinicians how to do this thing so um all of that to say I'd really be interested in reading your book because the things I don't know how much of what I do or don't like about different parts of the role are or are not due to it having been entirely virtual up to now um and so my question outside of all of that is, will this book be available in Canada? Because I think your bookseller is an American bookseller. Uh, Caversham's Toronto based, actually. Sorry for cutting oh. in, Hannah. Uh, Caversham's Toronto based. So you're welcome to go to their website, give them a call. They do both delivery and curbside pickup if you're in Toronto. That's beautiful. Thank you <laughs> so much. Um, and I hope, one, one thing that I do hope for the book I've taught clinicians before in this way, right? Where I'm not a clinician, but I'm like, what happens if we sit with this longer history and work on clinical papers together? Um, and one thing that I hope is that, you know, it, it is what's just happened with you and to you and for you in your professional life is like the rarest case, right? Where you learned the thing digitally and now you're going to go maybe, and do it in person. And that for many others, right, it was exactly the reverse. They'd never, they'd also never learned about teletherapy. And then suddenly it was like, poof, this is the thing. Um, and the, maybe the coda will also most directly talks about this, but what happens when choice comes back into it, right, uh, will feel totally psychologically different for all of us. I think we all know that, right? Um, and also for patients. Uh, and we're just seeing in the US in high vaccinated areas that choice start to come. Uh, and for folks who've never had an office, right? Where that was so much of what one imagines. Uh, I will have an office, it'll be my space, it'll be in a share. Um, it's a lot to give up. Uh, and also um, other people paradoxically are like, now I never have to do that, this is great. So, so much of it is individual. Um, wow, what an educational experience all remote. Thank you. Uh, Marcia, let's get you unmuted. Hi. Oh, sorry, Marcia, can you unmute? Okay. There we go. Okay, good. I have been amazed at how effective teletherapy can be. Uh, I've always enjoyed actually and found successful working on the phone. But what has amazed me is how effective it can be working with very specialized therapies, for instance, EMDR. EMDR involves a lot of, you know, bilateral stuff and tapping and noise and whatever. 
And if you're inventive, it's really amazing on either Zoom or FaceTime, even some on the phone, where you can do on the on uh, visually what you can do in the office. You can actually have do that. You can do this on the desk, and people can use that as the uh, sign to do whatever they're going to do on their own body. And I have found it extremely helpful. And there are some clients who prefer to do FaceTime. <laughs> I prefer FaceTime. I look better on FaceTime. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and there are a couple of clients now. I've just begun seeing uh, people in my office for the first time in two years because I had an accident before that. And last week I had my first new client in my office, you know, that I've never seen before. I couldn't remember what I do. I had about a week to gather everything. How, how do I start a session? How do I do this and whatever? So it was really fascinating. And uh, of course it's wonderful to work in person, but it has been extremely helpful. And there are clients now who are saying, I don't want to come to the office. It's better for me to do it because I, I can do it at my lunchtime and I don't have to take time off for work, et cetera, et cetera. Now that people are getting vaccinated, it's easier and easier. But I was surprised when my first client turned me down to come to the office. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to say. So do I now do something? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to mute myself again? <laughs> That's up to you. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you for the comment, though. You're welcome. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Margaret, did I see your hand waving? Oh, no? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Any other insights to share with, with Hannah? Um, I'm sure we'd all be interested as well, or questions for Hannah right now. Um, Someone had a comment in the or had a question about um, about mentioning Lawrence Murphy's work. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Um, he did a workshop for us right at the beginning of getting your practice online, and he was one of the uh, the pioneers of doing teletherapy as well. Um, and uh, I will send out that link if anyone's interested in it, as well as the person who requested it. There, are, there. Are Tammy either. has her hand up. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, uh, sorry, Hannah, you had said, added something? There, you know, there are a number of people who have um, worked up in various ways for different kinds of practices, some guidelines around teletherapy. You know, that was a big moment in the, and it was such a, a service to the field and to the fields right away. Like, what do I do? Um, and I think what's happened now in a really wonderful way over this last 16 months is, now folks have their own rules, right? They, they have their own kind of guidelines and just like the therapeutic frame, it was invented, it was set, and then it was sort of worked with them. And why is it FaceTime with this client and now we're on Zoom? Uh, do we do something special for this person or not? Um, and it's been really beautiful to see that kind of flexibility and intuition of the clinician come back in after this very, very, again, disruptive, immediate um, shift where lots of folks, no one had a Zoom account. I mean, what was Zoom? We were all using Skype and then suddenly here's the platform. You know, even these little shifts were so um, shocking. Um, so yeah, it's great to see uh, this Lawrence Murphy work and there are, there are a few others I can put in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tammy has her hand up and then we have a couple of chat questions. Hi, Tammy. Hi. I just wanted to say that uh, I love that uh, the topic that you've written about and um, over 15 years ago, I worked with a group of doctors who wanted to bring uh, addiction treatment to people who couldn't get it. Uh, I'm, I'm from Thunder Bay and we had individuals from Thunder Bay that were driving 18 hours to go and get treatment for their addictions, which is why the doctors opened up here and ended up having to use telehealth medicine and discovered that there are people even further north than us. So Thunder Bay became a hub and people were driving four hours to come here for treatment. And I used to do the um, motivational therapy um, by OTN and the phone with them. And because it was attached to addiction, 
a lot of people were naysayers saying it couldn't be done. And I mean, these clinics are still around. I, I was the, at the clinic for 10 whole years and we would constantly be listening to not just uh, the general population, but um, the CPSO and other medical associations saying like, this can't be done. You're not doing it properly. So now we've had the pandemic and finally all the work that was done before people are going, Oh yeah, it wasn't so bad. And it's interesting to see how people are changing their mind because they're basically forced to, it was either feast or famine. You either use technology or you didn't, but they really do have a huge resource to look back on to see what worked, what didn't, because it's been around. It's just nobody wanted to accept it because well, you're not in person, but the reality is I think some of the resistance was, is, it had to do with what the topic matter was. It was a moral thing. They, the things had not caught up to the reality of everyone deserves care, regardless if it's for addiction, mental health, or whatever. Um, so for me, even though the pandemic has been hard, I think, on everyone, I'm kind of grateful for it because it did remind people that, you know, when, in, when you can't get access to something, find a way. And this is the way we did it. So thanks for doing the book, and I'm looking forward to it coming out. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that also, you know, there are, there is, and, and I said, um, you know, Michael, that maybe we would touch in on that sort of app moment, right? That there, there has been, teletherapy has been escorted by this democratizing promise that we can push care further to those who need it most. And the most moving examples from the book, from life, are these moments where teletherapy does send help further uh, more effectively than it could otherwise. And there is this really disturbing trend, right? Um, of people who are still, who, will, who refuse to do that and therefore there's nothing, or who take that as a new market initiative in the most kind of high capitalist way while actually not changing fee structure, not sending it further and only duplicating what we all do do already in our offices. Um, but calling it something like you're, you're talking about, Tammy, right, this kind of real moral good. Um, and so that's a thing to watch out for, too, is how now on the other side of the pandemic, now that we're all so used to teletherapy, how these corporations are going to come in and take that up, um, saying they're doing what you're doing and not doing it at all. So it's something for us all to watch for, uh, again, especially in the U.S., Um, can you, um, why is therapy via email so effective compared to phone, video, or in person? Great. Thank you. Um, well, you know, it's funny in general, it's thought that it's not, um, that asynchronicity is the problem. So syn synchronous is what we're doing right now, unless you're watching the recording later and then you're doing the asynchronous version. Um, so when we're all together, um, we can clarify. If I misspeak, I can correct. We can circle back. And with email, this is much more um, thought to be disjointed. And I think that with email um, and writing, right, we, to not to just sound like the Freudian nerd I am, but, you know, when Freud developed the talking cure, he sort of plagiarized it from a, a theorist who is working on the writing cure, Right, the kind of idea that as we write things out, actually there's, there is also a catharsis. There's also a transference, I would argue. There's a lot that's proper to psychodynamic therapy right there in writing. Um, so some people have found that emailing or letter writing is very useful. Um, and also sometimes it's the only thing that can happen. I don't know if any of you had patients who uh, you know, were right on top of their you know, partners or parents or kids and couldn't speak freely, but they could write freely. And so email can be this, this um, other kind of container. It's also not as secure as speaking into the air um, because people can read it, uh, whether it's the clinician's partner or kids or the patient. So these are all these things to think about. Um, and for some, it's the only thing that works or a thing that works really well and works best. 
Thank you. Um, our next question is about um, our desire to be in person for things, not just for therapy, seems tied to our ability to travel rapidly or transportation access uh, in ways that people in the past could never do. Um, it's not always good for us in terms of stressors and it's not always good for the environment. Have you explored the connection between expectation for travel and being in person in our society and your work in teletherapy? That's a marvelous question. Whose question was that? That's great. Um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, it comes up kind of obliquely, like that idea of Freud's best friend living, you know, a thousand miles away or whatever, um, not even a thousand miles away. But, you know, this reminds me of the adoption of the telephone, like back in the day, um, where the telephone was first brought into homes as part of business right, uh, for the men who ran the business. But the people who early adopted it were their wives because their wives got to do a whole social calling apparatus on the phone instead of getting up, getting dressed, changing their clothes, putting on their clothes, going out, calling, coming home, changing again for the afternoon to go calling again. And instead they could do phone calling, which saved them all of that time and labor. Um, so thinking about efficacy and speed right? The time it would take me to get dressed is very much uh, a minuscule compared to a woman in 1920, um, right? I don't wear a totally other costume and clothing. So I wonder actually if there's something there that that's always been true, that when media can step in and save us from the labor and effort that's slow and painstaking of going out, we do it. I mean, we could just ask Gen X folks who wanted to talk all night on the telephone <laughs> instead of hanging out, right? Middle schoolers who, you know, I think that that argument is really there. What I love in that question too is how it crosses with the climate crisis, right? Where actually it's also, there is a moral and ethical good to not traveling. On the other hand, running Zoom with video has a huge ecological footprint. One hour of streaming Netflix is worse than running hundreds of refrigerators all year long. So what we have to also think about really specifically is what changes and when and how to implement. Just taking off the video again, that's the second time I've done this gimmick, reduces drastically the ecological footprint of a thing like that. So, but the face is also what allows us to feel connected for some. So these are the questions. I love that question. Thank you. I'll be thinking about it Thank all you. day. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, and it asks, is it possible to provide a brief sketch of how therapy via letter writing or in a medium where two people are not connected in the moment, how that unfolds? Sure. Um, I think, you know, I've, I've touched on this just a little bit, which is to say that whether it's Freud's moment or ours, whether it's the email or not, we have these ways of making ourselves feel presenced and feeling the presence of the other. And this is where the medium specific, but also moment specific in history stuff comes in. For Freud in letter writing, it was always by um, making speech, right? Uh, in the writing by saying, oh, my best friend, I love talking with you for this hour in my house. What a delightful tea we've had. Obviously, they're writing letters to each other. There was no tea. But they engage in that kind of fantasy of hanging out embodied. Um, in email, there are other ways of doing what are called emailisms, presencing the voice, the pace, the pitch. So a lot of that's at play. Um, and again, some of that is based on fantasy, on the gap where there is a lot of projection. Uh, and some of it is just like ingrained and social. When you read your own emails, right? There's a greeting, there's a signing off and this stuff happens kind of intuitively. There was one other question I just wanna to touch about this idea of, of teletherapy across borders. Um, and all of this is shifting. Um, so lots of states in the US have parity licensing. So California and New York, that's also why all those teletherapy apps started in California and New York. So they don't democratize like in the middle of the US where there are fewer clinicians, right? Those licenses aren't reciprocal. All of this is changing. Folks are fighting for a national license in the US, which will also have big downsides because it will give rise to even further corporate teletherapy models, but it will also protect individual clinicians. So all of that's at work right now. And I suggest looking at the work of Todd Isig on this question and on every teletherapy question, Todd's amazing. Uh, 
And so that's a just a little shout out to Todd about the legal side. Well, thank you, Hannah. We'll put that link with uh, all the other resources and your email address when we send out this video to everyone. And we'll also include uh, some links for our next couple of virtual lunches next Monday with Sharon Ramsey and Martin Anthony the week after that. Um, I'll just say one more thing based on what you just commented on, Hannah, that we had a lawyer who was asked a lot of questions about uh, counseling online, teletherapy, cross borders or cross provinces. And his suggestion was for all the different professions to go to the associations of those professions and ask them for the latest bit of news that, that things are changing and associations of psychologists, therapists, social workers, whatever, are a good resource uh, for the pro pro provincially and nationally. Okay, I know you have six hours of classes coming up. Our time so, is up, unfortunately. <laughs> pardon? Yeah, our time is up, but we'll do two things. You'll have the second to last word, and then we open up all our, our microphones. People can say thank you and goodbye, and that's the way we end today. So Hannah, I'll start off by saying it's been such a pleasure and good luck with your book. It's so timely and I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in what you have to say and in that book. So Hannah, second to last word to you and then to everybody. Thank you so much for joining. This was so fun and what amazing questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.